uh, uh, meaning capital, the EU area was mostly doing so by means of uh, asset shrinkage. Now, at the same time, uh, I document uh, patterns of uh, uh, dividend distributions and earnings for a representative uh, a segment of the EU area banking sector. And as you can see in, in, in panel A, uh, dividends evolve in a substantially uh, smoother fashion than uh, earnings of the euro banking sector and uh, that, that has two important implications first that the dividend payout ratio is going to be notably counter cyclical uh, and second that um, retain earnings are going to play a key role in uh, in driving uh, bank capital in the sense that they are particularly volatile especially uh, during recessions and um, and they account for roughly 50 percent of, of of total equity within the banking sector now importantly <clears throat> note the potential uh, the potential link between these two trends obviously if uh, banks in the euro area are very reluctant to cut on uh, dividends uh, in the face of uh, severe exogenous negative shocks. That means that they are going to retain less earnings when they are needed the most. And they, ultimately, they have incentives to uh, meet their capital requirements by deleveraging rather than by improving uh, their capital positions. Uh, so these uh, unintended macroeconomic effects of existing capital regulation uh, can uh, have important implications for the real economy. Know that there are important uh, co-movements uh, between cumulative retained earnings and bank equity and the former uh, and aggregate bank assets uh, through, uh, through the balance sheet identity and through the stable proportions of debt and equity banks usually hold over the cycle. But most importantly, uh, cumulative written earnings uh, notably commute with bank assets uh, understood as a proxy for aggregate lending for uh, households and firms and with real GDP. Now, there are uh, two potential channels through which this uh, pattern of TV and smoothing could translate into uh, uh, an increased problem of uh, credit supply procyclicality. First, through the bank's uh, balance sheet effect that I just mentioned, and second, through capital requirements, as I already mentioned as well. So, uh, due to these two key uh, restrictions banks are going to face in a context of strong preference for dividend smoothing, we may potentially have amplifications in the credit cycle. Here are the three uh, key questions I'm going to raise in the paper and that I will try to answer by the end of this, uh, first, of, of this first part of the presentation. But the most important question I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer in this paper is uh, the first one in red. Is it optimal to regulate dividends even if banks meet their capital requirements, which is something uh, that so far uh, uh, was not being considered uh, or, or has has been considered neither by the academia nor uh, by policymakers until recently. Now, in doing so, I'm going to uh, adopt uh, DSG macro banking perspective. Now, consider a real closed and decentralized economy in which all markets are competitive. In the most basic model, um, I'm going to consider just three types of agents, savers, borrowers, and financial uh, intermediaries. And uh, the key ingredients are the following. Uh, bank capital accumulates out of return earnings, meaning we just have inside equity financing. Uh, there's endogenous bank payout policies. Um, and there's just one key financial friction, which are borrowing limits a la Iacobello 2005 and 2015. The relationship between the discount factors of the different types of agents is such that financial flows in equilibrium exist and uh, the, 
borrowing constraints are binding in the neighborhood of the, of the steady state. I'm not going to get into the details of the model due to time constraints, but this is a very standard uh, Jacobello type of, uh, of model in which, importantly, bankers, uh, um, on top of the fact that uh, bank owners have a preference uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, dividend smoothing, uh, which is going to become more explicit in the extended version of the model, uh, bank managers have uh, a preference for smoothing dividends over the cycle. And they, uh, they, they face three important restrictions. The balance sheet identity that I just mentioned, um, one period loans are going to be financed by bank equity and, and deposits, uh, and the capital requirements uh, constraint by which the complementary of gamma one minus gamma can be interpreted as a capital requirement. Now, total profits in terms of the, uh, the net lending margin and uh, minored by uh, credit adjustment costs, assumed for empirical reasons, are going to devote uh, are going to be devoted to uh, distribute dividends and to retain earnings. Uh, to see this more clearly, note that. Uh, bank capital accumulates out of retained earnings, where J denotes total profits and can be decomposed into retained earnings and distributed dividends. And retained earnings at the same time, at the same time can be decomposed in, into reinvested profits and what I call eroded equity or the cost of managing the capital position uh, by bankers as assumed in Geralia et al. Uh, 2010 and, and Angelini, Nari, and Panetta 2014. Now, the optimality condition is of the banker is the most important equation of the model in the sense that uh, through this equation is uh, uh, through which uh, dynamic uh, through which uh, dynamic capital requirements and what I call dividend prudential targets are going to operate. Now, let me define the, the regulatory scheme I'm going to propose. Uh, it's I call dividend prudential target. Uh, dividend prudential target is composed of a, a structural or microprudential component and a macroprudential uh, or cyclical component uh, by which this target the regulator sets um, uh, as a reference banks should take when uh, when uh, when um, setting their payout policies is going to respond to deviations of a macro of a macroeconomic indicator uh, from uh, from uh, the the trend or steady state level of such uh, of such indicator, uh, this indicator could be the the credit to to GDP ratio, for instance. This dividend potential target is going to enter into a quadratic penalty function uh, when kappa is positive. Uh, bankers have to pay a penalty uh, from deviating from such target. Now, note how the, the optimality condition is going to change. Now, we are going to induce higher volatility in dividend distributions in the denominator on each side of the equation. And in that way, uh, we are going to smooth variables that uh, appear in the financial intermediation activity. That is, uh, thanks to this, uh, thanks to this uh, instrument, uh, now um, um, written earnings are going to burn the adjustment in the face of exogenous shocks that hit bank profits to a lesser extent than before. And then this is uh, an, a similar uh, policy rule uh, for um, dynamic dividend restrictions, uh, where the second term stands for the macroprudential component and it's going to allow us to um, model uh, somehow the counter-cyclical capital buffer. Now, first I'm going to carry out a very simple exercise in which I want to assess the th different transmission mechanisms through which the CCYB and the dividend prudential target operate and, and um, the potential each of these two macroprudential instruments have to tame the financial cycle. 
Now, note on this table, I'm just basically assuming that the, the prudential authority is minimizing uh, uh, um, uh, the volatility, the asymptotic variance of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a macroeconomic indicator of the choice of the regulator. And what I find is that uh, regardless of the indicator I consider, um, the dividend prudential target is more effective in smoothing the, the financial cycle than the already existing uh, counter-cyclical capital buffer. Now, in order to understand this, look at the different transmission mechanisms through which they are operating. What the dividend potential, what the optimized dividend potential target is doing in uh, re the red start line is to, um, is to uh, provide bankers to tolerate a higher degree of dividend volatility and therefore, retain earnings and bank capital are going to uh, evolve in a smoother fashion than under the baseline scenario in blue. Uh, and that's going to uh, trigger a credit smoothing effect. Uh, the CCYB is operating in the opposite direction, actually. Uh, the adjustment is borne by bank capital, which in the lower phase of the cycle represent a lower proportion of the total bank balance sheet and now we smooth through bank debt and in that way we smooth the financial cycle but the dpt is basically more effective to tame the financial and the uh, and the business cycle as i'm going to show you uh, throughout the entire presentation because it directly attacks the root of the problem namely uh, banks preference for smoothing dividends over the cycle now, let me briefly uh, comment on how I extend the model to bring the model to the data. Now we have two types of uh, households, uh, savers and borrowers, and these two types of households uh, own all different types of non-financial and financial firms in the, in, the, in the model economy. I'm going to assume additional uh, assumptions for empirical reasons and a variety of exogenous shocks. Uh, to have a more meaningful welfare analysis um, um, of these uh, prudential policies. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of uh, the calibration, but the calibration strategy follows uh, uh, a three-stage approach. Importantly, I calibrate uh, a number of macro uh, and banking um, uh, or, or I calibrate a number of parameters to match a number of macro and banking second moments. And that's very important to have a meaningful wealth analysis because otherwise we may have uh, numbers which don't uh, make that much sense in terms of volatilities and welfare gains. The alternative, of course, would be to, to estimate the model. Uh, so as you can see, I match a number of uh, first and second moments of, the, of your era data. And, uh, Starting with the welfare analysis, I assume a uh, uh, measure of social welfare is specified as the weighted, uh, as a weighted average of uh, the expected lifetime utility of the two types of households, patient households and inpatient households. Importantly, for a number of technical, theoretical and empirical reasons that I carefully discuss in, uh, in, in my papers um, uh, in the calibrate the calibration is such that patient households own all the all, all the non-financial firms and inpatient households own all the banks in the economy and that is not only important for technical reasons but also um, to clearly uh, and more easily isolate the welfare effects and trade-off trade-offs that these policy rules are going to trigger uh, in the model economy, but of course, the, the, the results need to be interpreted accordingly. Now, I'm going to assume two different welfare weighting criteria for completeness, for the sake of completeness. In, in the first one, both of them are relatively standard in the, mac in the recent macro banking literature. In the first one, uh, I'm going to assume that, uh, to w and both of them are trying to uh, uh, carefully weight uh, in patient households' welfare, uh, because otherwise, due to the discrepancy between 
uh, subjected this discount factors of the two different uh, agent types, uh, we may we we would be otherwise underweight in uh, in patient households utility. Now, so in the first uh, criterion, I assume that. Uh, the weight of the agent type is equal to the complementary of its of of its um, uh, discount factor, and in the second one, I directly impose that the welfare gains cannot be negative for any of the agent types, and that uh, welfare gains for both agent types uh, in the optimum uh, need to be equal. Um, now, these are the welfare gains uh, for each uh, agent type uh, expressed in percentage permanent consumption, um, as in Smith, Gura, and Uribe uh, 2007. As you can see, each uh, agent type is going to face a different welfare trade off uh, for changes in the key macroprudential parameter of the dividend prudential target. The most relevant uh, policy trade off is the one faced by borrowers. They have to trade, and ultimately, the Prudential Authority has to trade uh, the preference of bank owners between credit smoothing and dividend smoothing in a context. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, they have to trade off, yeah, the, the preference for both uh, types of moves, smoothing in a context in which dividend volatility induced by uh, uh, this type of uh, dividend regulation is going to harm bank owners, which in this case are uh, inpatient households. Uh, the trade-off phase by savers is not that meaningful because it only shows up for already uh, prohibitively uh, responsive uh, degrees of the dividend prudential target. And what is going, going on here is that when the, the target is too responsive, at some point, uh, the rule negatively affects the level of credit provision. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the different um, of the different uh, welfare effects that are going on here. They are all in my paper. But the most important thing I wanted to highlight here is that optimal structural capital requirements in this model economy are slightly lower than in the Basel III uh, regulatory scheme. Why? because uh, they are trading off several welfare effects, uh, importantly, two uh, of a very different nature. One is uh, the negative, uh, the negative uh, uh, balance sheet effect of capital requirements accounted for in this model economy. And the larger the proportion of capital uh, uh, is in the balance sheet of the bank, the higher uh, or the more negative, uh, or the more, uh, yeah, the more uh, welfare decreasing is, the, the increased volatility in bank capital and ultimately in credit supply induced by dividend smoothing. But on the other hand, the, the, the more stringent capital re regulation is, uh, the more I reinforce as a banker my profit generation capacity and therefore uh, the more capable I am uh, of paying uh, uh, future expected um, high uh, dividend payouts. Now, the bottom line is that if we combine uh, an increase in structural capital requirements with an optimal uh, dividend prudential target, we are gonna uh, we are gonna um, attain certain important welfare gains to the extent that uh, we are going to compensate for that uh, negative welfare effect um, induced by uh, the hike in capital requirements. Now, as you can see, so, and importantly, the, 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 more, uh, the more stringent capital regulation is, these are different uh, capital regulatory scenarios, the more responsive the optimal dividend prudential target is, as you can see in the figures, the more, the less stringent is in the red dashed line, the less responsive the optimal dividend prudential target is. Now, important uh, for also for the analysis of my second paper is to understand the interactions between the counter cyclical capital buffer 
and the dividend prudential target. For the case of savers, those who benefit of, from a credit smoothing and indirectly because they own non-financial firms who, uh, who uh, leverage their activity, their investments, there's uh, a relationship of strong complementarity between, between the responsiveness of the DPT and the CCYB for the policy relevant range of macro potential policy parameter values, while for bank owners who are borrowers as well, it happens exactly the opposite. While borrowers appreciate a lot a dividend prudential target when there's no uh, CCYB in place or when the CCYB in place is uh, mildly responsive, the more responsive the CCYB becomes, the less I need the DPT because, you know, at the end of the day, even though the DPT is more effective in smoothing the credit and the business cycle for the reasons that I just stated, um, the DPT is at the same time harming bank owners in terms of increased dividend volatility. So if the CCYB is responsive enough, enough as a bank owner, um, I prefer to have uh, a highly responsive CCYB in place. But the bottom line, and this is very important, is that even for a very, res very highly responsive CCYB, when compared to the empirical and regulatory relevant calibration of the CCYB in practice, it is optimal even for, uh, for those households who own banks in this model economy to have a positive and responsive dividend prudential target in place. And at the social level, it happens the same even for this uh, welfare weighting criterion uh, A in which uh, borrowers, meaning bank owners, are heavily weighted, as you can actually see in the different, in the different figures. Now, what I'm just saying is that uh, there are important complementarities between the dividend prudential target and existing counter-cyclical counter capital regulation, although depending uh, uh, on whether, the, on whether uh, savers welfare or borrowers welfare, welfare is uh, weighting more on the measure of social welfare, uh, the direction of the relationship of complementarity of, or substability between the degree of responsiveness of each of the two um, uh, policy rules is going to be different. Now, what I want to show you here also is that uh, despite the fact, again, despite the fact that both rules are quite uh, uh, effective in smoothing the credit and the business cycle, overall, uh, the dividend prudential target is going to be more effective in doing so also in this setup, as you can see in this, again, very simple uh, quantitative exercise in which the Prudential Authority uh, under full commitment uh, is going to minimize in the asymptotic variance of a particular uh, macroeconomic indicator of the choice of the regulator. Now, in particular, and this is another source of complementarity between the two, macroprudential policy rules and their consideration, um, um, dividend prudential targets are particularly more effective than the CCYB uh, when it comes to uh, facing uh, the effects of exogenous non-financial shocks. And as it has been widely documented in the recent literature, the CCYB is relatively more effective in taming the cycle in the face of financial shocks than in the face of non-financial shocks such as uh, productivity shocks. So this is certainly something to be taken into consideration as well. So to summarize, um, um, due to the different transmission mechanisms through which the different macroprudential policy rules are operating, the DPT is more effective in smoothing and the credit and the business cycle than the CCYB. Uh, combining uh, an optimal DPT with existing Basel III uh, type of capital regulation induces important uh, welfare gains for both savers or, or, and borrowers, although, although calibration needs to uh, be uh, taken into consideration with a lot of care because we need to uh, trade off different effects. There are complementarities 
be, between uh, the DPT and the microprudential uh, dimension of capital regulation, but also uh, with macroprudential dimension of capital regulation. And again, there are important uh, complementarities in, in this regard, in the sense that uh, households who own banks and those who do not own banks have different preferences in this regard, and the effectiveness of each of the uh, policy rules in the face of non-financial shocks and financial shocks is uh, quite different. Let me now start uh, with the presentation of the second paper of my uh, um, uh, of my thesis. This is gonna this is going to be a a, a, a brief uh, presentation because it's just an additional extension of the model that I have just uh, presented. This is joint work work with uh, with Carlos Montes Galdon. And by the way, this is really a work in progress and is very preliminary. So obviously, uh, questions and, and comments are more than welcome. Now, uh, first, I'm going to provide you with a little bit of motivation. Then I'm going to just mention how I extend the model proposed in Munoz 2020. Then I carry out uh, quantitative analysis and I uh, conclude with some uh, remarks. Now, and this is very important. Think of the, the recent COVID-19 shock. Uh, central banks are going to respond by adopting a, a, an array of uh, monetary and prudential uh, policy measures. Uh, so in a, constant, uh, in a context of significant uh, uh, monetary accommodation, um, central banks adopt an array of relief measures uh, with a prudential nature and in first place what they are going to do is to encourage banks to release capital buffers. Now what's going to happen? Uh, that banks remain hesitant to draw on their buffers. Why? So uh, the regulation in this regard is not working uh, properly. Uh, why? Well, uh, experts are talking about stigma effects in financial markets. Well, what's what's uh, the tangible thing uh, when we talk about uh, stigma effects in financial markets? Well, it has to do again with payout policies. Banks do not want to cut back on dividends uh, during a recession because they consider that they are going to be penalized in financial markets. And the, th the fact is that the Basel III uh, regulation uh, uh, imposes an automatic dividend uh, restrictions when uh, capital requirements uh, for a particular bank uh, fall below a certain threshold, and this um, this regulation is institution specific. And it turns out that is not providing banks with the right incentives. Uh, uh, it's not providing banks with the right incentives to draw on their buffers when they are needed the most. Why? Because if I release the buffer uh, too much in the recession, I, 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 I take the risk of breaching this capital threshold and then I cannot distribute dividends, stigma effect. Now, what's the, the, the central bank's reaction uh, all over the world? They request banks to refrain from distributing dividends, no matter whether uh, they are solvent or not, no matter whether uh, they are meeting or not their capital requirements with uh, important buffers. Just a macroeconomic based dividend restriction that applies to all bank to all banks in principle. Now, and I'm not I've never said this and, and the usual disclaimer applies here as usual, uh, of course, but in my view, central banks have de facto switch from microprudential institution specific and capital contingent dividend regulation, which is uh, in uh, stated as is stated in Basel III uh, regulatory framework, to a macroprudential and state contingent dividend regulation, which is what I advocate in in the paper that I just presented, with the sole difference that the measure central banks have adopted is a discretionary measure, which therefore is uh, when repeated a lot is more. Uh, would be more painful uh, in terms of uh, potential uh, stigma effects, whereas my proposal is a, a regulatory scheme 
which would be known by all uh, <clears throat> bank owners who would, be, who would potentially be interested in becoming uh, bank shareholders. Now, therefore, does Basel III uh, need reform in this regard? In my view, yes. Now, uh, against this background, um, what we are going to do is to assess the interactions between monetary policy and this type of macroprudential dividend regulation. Uh, uh, and we're going to try to answer the question of how these two policies should be coordinated. Um, of course, the context is, again, the Basel III regulatory uh, environment in which the CCYB uh, could be effective or not, as it has been the case in the recent past. We're going to consider the two different scenarios. Now, so uh, I'm going to adopt, again, a DSG macro banking uh, approach. And uh, I'm going to just, uh, we, or we are just extending uh, um, uh, the model I previously presented along two dimensions. We are going to endogenize housing for empirical, uh, housing supply for empirical reasons. So now we have a two sector model economy and we are going to uh, incorporate price stickiness by assuming that entrepreneurial firms are, um, are price setters uh, a la calvo in the, in the market of their own variety. And as in Giacobello and Neri 2010, uh, we are going to assume that there's price stickiness only in the non-housing production sector. The very standard, simple Taylor rule is going to apply. So we are going to have an additional type of shock, namely interest rate shocks on top of the other five shocks that were already existent in the previous version of the model. Now, I'm going to uh, calibrate the model again, following a similar strategy as in Munoz 2020. Importantly, we match a number of uh, first and second moments of macro and banking area bank, banking data. And uh, we are going to consider what I previously called welfare weighting criterion A uh, to uh, carefully weight uh, inpatient households again in the measure of social welfare. Why? Because in this model economy, uh, crucially, uh, inpatient households are those who are uh, more di directly affected by all the relevant trade-offs public authorities need to take into consideration in this, in this model economy. The central bank needs to strike a balance between the benefits of price stability and the incentives for uh, marginally affect uh, for marginally affecting uh, borrowers' collateral constraints, because you know, if we allow for a higher degree of inflation, that's going to uh, trigger a smoothing effect on the real value of the debt service of borrowers in this economy. And the provincial authority uh, has to face the already uh, well uh, known uh, trade off between credit smoothing and bank dividend smoothing that I already mentioned. And I'm going to assume very conservative assumptions, uh, which all of them at the end of the day mean that we are taking a lot of care of bank owners' utility when carrying out this welfare analysis. And in this environment, and under these very conservative assumptions, we state again, or we raise again the same question Is macroprudential dividend regulation still optimal? Well, uh, first of all, and, and before uh, considering the interaction between the three different um, macroeconomic policy rules we are considering in our analysis, we consider three different scenarios. In each of them, uh, there's only one macroeconomic policy rule that is active. And, and here we report the welfare gains associated to each of the three different optimal policy rules in isolation. Note that for the case of the simple Taylor rule, I'm considering a, re a relevant, uh, implementable, and meaningful range for the three different parameters of, of, the, of, the, um, of the simple Taylor rule. And importantly, 
um, the inflation coefficient is not bounded by the upper bound we impose. Uh, that is bound. Uh, this coefficient is bounded to the, the to a value of three, as in many other papers, as like Smith, Groney, River, 2007, for instance. Now. Um, Note the welfare trade-offs again for the case of the dividend potential target and the CYB are the ones you already know. But importantly, for the case of the inflation coefficient of the Taylor rule, what we have is that indeed uh, borrowers uh, need to trade off their preferences, preferences in terms of price stability and those in terms of uh, stabilizing the real value of their debt. Uh, through uh, a higher degree of uh, inflation, and that's uh, reflected in social welfare. Now, important result of this paper, no matter the nature of the shock that we take into consideration, optimal dividend prudential targets are more effective than any of the other type of optimal policy rules under consideration when consider each of them in isolation. I'm just showing you two socks, but you will be able to see the different uh, impulse responses for the different for the six different types of socks in the in the paper. Now, let me just very briefly comment the main uh, findings of this uh, uh, investigation of the interactions uh, between monetary policy and the two different macroprudential policy rules. First of all, there are Substantial welfare gains from combining the dividend potential target and, a, a, and an optimal, uh, uh, simple Taylor rule. And under coordination, there are welfare gains uh, attained from a specialization. Uh, the dividend potential target becomes more responsive, and, and, the, and the Taylor rule monetary policy specializes more in inflation targeting. Now, importantly, even under a very highly responsive CCYB uh, and an optimal simple Taylor rule, and under very conservative um, assumptions that are really considering uh, bank owners' welfare, it is optimal to regulate dividends from a macroprudential perspective. Now, these three figures are just showing the different welfare effects com when combining different uh, uh, coordination policy options. Um, you can have a look at them in, 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 the, in our paper, but uh, the last part of our quantitative analysis is basically uh, assessing the effects of the proposed optimal macroprudential uh, policy rules in a low interest rate on environment. The, the solid lines, refer to the, the to the baseline uh, to the baseline scenario and to the optimal dividend potential target scenario and the dashed lines refer to the same scenarios but when monetary policy hits the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates know how note how important the the, the effect of uh, optimal dividend potential target targets becomes uh, when the economy hits the zero lower bound, a very powerful uh, smoothing effect on bank capital that is going to translate in a, a very powerful smoothing effect uh, with regards to aggregates of the real economy. Something similar happens uh, for the case of the CYB, but importantly, the, again, the, the channel or the effects in terms of the different channels through which each of the dif two different rules are operating gets magnified. So now uh, note that the fall in bank capital due to the use or to the release of the CYB in this type of environment, the current en environment, actually is really severe. It's really severe. And so this exercise is just highlighting the importance of combining measures of capital conservation through dividend regulation with measures of what I call capital usability through a counter cyclical capital regulation. And let me devote the last few minutes of the presentation to um, 
provide you with a little bit of motivation of what's the third um, paper of my thesis about and, and to give you uh, and to share the main findings with you. The paper um, entitled Macroprudential Policy and the Role of Institutional Investors in Housing Markets uh, is uh, uh, concerned with the fact that uh, since um, since the global financial crisis, since the outbreak of the global financial crisis, the, the presence of institutional investors in housing markets has steadily increased. And actually, uh, the recovery in property prices and some other aggregates in this market is notably due to, the, to this change or to this big shift. Uh, or big structural change in housing markets and things have uh, happened around this change in patterns. First, that uh, basically these institutional investors are, per, are leveraging uh, large uh, buy-to-rent uh, purchases in real estate assets, which eventually allows them to set uh, rental housing prices in the market of their own rental housing variety varieties markets and you know things have happened uh, in many countries uh, because rents have increased um home ownership rates have decreased and so on o obviously everything has happened in a context of more stringent uh, uh collateral uh, housing collateral regulation now um Importantly, many experts and analysts have warned about uh, the risks of, uh, of a bubble burst, potentially bursting in the, in the private credit uh, market. Crucially, the fact is that, um, that real estate funds and other types of companies uh, that uh, invest in in, in housing, they get indebted, but uh, an important fraction of that debt takes the form of non-bank uh, lending, which is not subject to uh, to loan-to-value ratios, let alone to macroprudential loan-to-value policy rules. And actually, we don't even know exactly the numbers in terms of how, uh, how indebted these real estate funds are because uh, many different types of real uh, uh, investment funds lever up through the use of uh, derivatives. Now, this this uh, this figure is, is showing you actually uh, how uh, how um, investment in in housing investment by institutional investors has notably uh, increased both in absolute terms and, uh, and in relative terms as a proportion of total housing investment uh, since uh, the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And it's still, the trend still is still going on in uh, early 2020, according to the most uh, uh, recent uh, readily available data. Now, I'm gonna uh, develop a model, which is uh, again a two uh, production sector model, as in Jacobello and Nelly 2010. Uh, I mo explicitly model not only the property housing market, but also the rental housing uh, market. And I'm gonna consider dynamic loan to value ratios as the relevant macroprudential tool. And I'm going to assess what happens if uh, uh, real estate funds were eventually uh, subject to the type of counter-cyclical loan-to-value ratios uh, other agents are subject to, such as households, due to the fact that uh, bank lending is subject to this type of regulation and non-bank lending is not subject to this type of regulation. But the findings apply also to the discussion, to the ongoing policy discussion in terms of uh, whether whether should we uh, regulate uh, investment funds leverage or not? Because actually, 
a great proportion of uh, debt uh, obtained or financial resources obtained by these real estate funds is coming from debt funds, um, which are uh, well known for exacerbating uh, through their activity um, and the, the, the business cycle. Now, uh, consider a real close decentralized and time discrete economy. There are three types of household savers, borrowers, and renters, depending on, on the role they, they play in the in, in credit markets and in uh, and in housing markets and real estate funds uh, populated by, by two types of agents managers and retailers and then we have housing and non-housing goods producers i'm not gonna get into the details of the model uh, but this is available in 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 the in the ecb working paper series if you want to uh, have a look at that, but I'm just going to move directly to the main findings and to how the uh, the instrument that I propose uh, works, because indeed uh, fund managers are are, are going to be subject to again a uh, housing collateral constraint, and uh, if the, the optimality conditions of fund managers in the steady state read as, follow, as follows. And basically what uh, these optimality conditions are saying is that in the face of uh, negative shocks that translate into a positive uh, number inside this parenthesis, uh, imply a negative relationship between the loan to value ratio and the relevant rental housing price. So basically what is going to happen with this uh, policy rule is that when a negative shock uh, hits the economy, um, uh, the borrowing capacity of the real estate fund is tightened. Therefore, uh, this real estate fund demands less loans so we smooth the credit cycle uh, and it restricts uh, its uh, rental housing supply so now the proportion of of rental housing supply uh, uh, offered by by households who operate as suppliers in this market but under perfect competition in contrast <laughs> to what uh, real estate fund managers are doing who are uh, operating under monopolistic competition uh, is gonna become more relevant and therefore we have a smoothing effect on the reference perfectly competitive rental housing uh, price as well. So um, again, I'm gonna skip uh, some of the parts of, of this paper. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the, the usual three-stage calibration strategy I follow um, uh, to map the model to the data. And what I'm going to do here is not to uh, carry out a welfare analysis, but to carry out the type of, the type of um, ad hoc loss function uh, minimization uh, analysis for different uh, macroeconomic indicators which are usually relevant to prudential authorities because you know we have diff three different types of households with different uh, objective functions in the sense that renters ha um, um, maximize uh, their objective function in an static environment and everything uh, complicates a bit more uh, the fact of uh, providing you with, a, with a, let's say, a welfare criterion that would not be subject to various uh, potential shortcomings in this environment. So what I'm doing uh, to sum up and to conclude is to uh, assess for different calibrations uh, of key selected parameters for different specifications of the model and for different macroeconomic indicators of the choice of the regulator, I assess what's the optimal uh, loan-to-value uh, policy in a context in which, again, there's loan, 
countercyclical loan to value ratios affecting uh, uh, inpatient households decision and real estate fund managers decisions. And what I find is that no matter what, regardless of the specification of the model, uh, regardless of the calibration of the model, even, even if I assume a calibration such that uh, or a preference for real estate funds services such that um, uh, real estate funds only hold 1% of the total stock of housing in this model economy and therefore a very uh, small fraction of debt, the optimal policy is to just uh, have one uh, uh, optimal LTV, LTV ratio in place, namely the one that affects real estate funds and uh, act in a very responsive way in this regard. And by the way, LTV ratios that affect uh, real estate funds in green are more effective in taming the credit and the business cycle, but also property housing prices uh, when compared uh, to, the, to the LTV ratio affecting uh, inpatient households and regardless of the nature of the SOC, as you can see in the paper. So again, very, very, very strong results that affect policies that are not yet in place, but which are very important, actually, in this case, also from a social perspective, because there are many uh, countries which have regulated rental housing prices uh, due to this issue, which is a policy that generates price distortions and by applying this type of macroprudential policy measures, we could attain uh, even that type of uh, policy goal without generating uh, the mentioned uh, price distortions. So that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot for, for attending and for listening to, to uh, such a wide, uh, uh, such a large number of uh, different findings. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Manuel. You cannot complain. You had the, the full slot for your presentation. Now we have time for questions. Can you open your micro? Mine, mine is open, right? Okay. So, ah. Yeah, Manuel. Fernanda, you want to? Yeah, but I know, I know. Can you hear me? Can, yes. can you hear me now, Manuel? Yes. Well, uh, I was understanding that the invitation was not for your thesis defense. So if I make, I have three quick questions for it, you. It is a normal seminar. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, in the present context, when the uh, Bank of International Settlements chairman, Agustin Carstens, has asked banks not to pay dividend this year because of COVID and not to repurchase their stocks with or without stimulus packages. Some banks already agreed to that, like uh, Banco Santander in Mexico. How do you see the incentives in your model and findings working in this regard? That's my first question. The second one is that in the pandemic, in this pandemic, also we have seen the banking business model on bail when people's savings in the banks have increased, but banks have lost income. They are encouraging spending with credit cards because they rather not take risks lending money to develop business opportunities and the real economy, but commissions and trapped credit cards holders holders with credit lines beyond their means of payment. Uh, sorry about that long question. And um, the last one, do you also see a bubble bursting in the housing market market of the USA? Thank you so much, Manuel. I'm sorry <laughs> for these many questions, oh, yeah. but your presentation was very, very extensive. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. So coming back to the first to the first question. Um, so can you 
can, can you repeat again or or be more specific about uh, what do you mean by incentives in this regard? So, uh, do you uh, mind? If I understood you right, uh, you consider that central banks have the the means to make uh, to set dividends policy to the banking system. Mm -hmm. And Agustin Carson at the BIS yeah. said yeah. that this year banks should not pay dividends yeah. and should not repurchase stocks. Yeah. So this is his saying. And you say that the, the central banks have the means. This is like the coordinator of the central banks in the world, in, the, yeah. in most part of the world. And I don't know if that saying match you, what you are seeing in your findings. Is it oh, possible yeah. according you, to your findings? Is it possible that, that they have the incentive to follow this um, Carson suggestion or strong suggestion to the banks? No, yeah, so that was my point. Uh, so this paper I just presented was already distributed, by the way, uh, uh, two years, yeah, like two years ago. So it, this proposal took place before uh, the COVID shock uh, hit the economy. But that's what I was trying to say. The fact of what all central banks uh, have been doing is to adopt uh, a similar type of macroprudential uh, policy or prudential policy uh, as the one that I'm proposing on, on, in my paper. The difference is that what I assess or what I study in my paper is a, a macroprudential regulation, meaning it's not a discretionary temporary measure as the one that uh, the central banks have been forced to adopt in this current context in which the Basel III uh, Accord does not account for this. Uh, the, Basel, the thing is that the, the dividend regulation in the Basel III Accord is uh, of a microprudential nature and institution specific, as I just said. And since this was not working and it was actually giving the wrong incentives for banks to draw on their buffers, they have to switch, de facto, they have to switch to the type of uh, regulation that I advocate. Um, but obviously there are specificities uh, in, in the type of regulation that I propose, which are different to, to the measure that, that, has, that has been implemented. Because again, the measure that has been implemented is, is not in the regulation. It's something, it's like a discretionary measure, they just, realized that they really needed to, to adopt because th things in certain aspect of the Basel III agreement, among other reasons, were not working properly. Um, and, but actually, and this is very important, the, the, the dividend prudential target does not negatively affect the total amount of dividends that are distributed over the cycle. It only affects its variability. It's, it's just uh, affecting uh, so dividends are uh, now relatively more volatile, but, but still uh, procyclical. During the downturn, banks, according to the rules, should pay less dividends than those they would be paying uh, without dividend regulation. But during the upturn, they should be allowed to pay more dividends than they would be paying um, uh, without dividend regulation somehow um, accounting for the dividends they didn't pay during the downturn. So what I'm saying is, and this is, and this uh, should go in favor of investors and shareholders. And that's what I always try to emphasize. You know, uh, as a shareholder, I would like to make sure that uh, the banking sector is contributing to macroeconomic stability and that the bank in which I am investing is solvent. And this is a very powerful way of, of attaining such goal. I see. Uh, sorry, and then the second question, can you repeat again? So I'm sorry. Eh? Um, no, sorry about my long questions. No, um, the uh, I, I didn't get uh, very well the, the relationship. Can you 
rephrase the question, please? I'm sorry. What we have, what we have seen, at least in Mexico, is that yes. people is saving more money in the banks during the pandemic, thirteen percent up, and uh, the banks are losing income uh, by thirty percent. So uh, this just for me unveils how the the banking business model is working. Uh, not fulfilling its ultimate purpose of um, being a payment system to um, invest and take risk in in business opportunities to develop the economies. So uh, I think we are trapped onto that. And also, I don't know if you have um, studied that and analyzed that because the, those dividends are based on commissions, not on the on the um, initial purpose of a bank that is uh, providing money from uh, from um, lenders to borrowers and uh, um, grow the economy. So it is not fulfilling that purpose. However, it is getting an income and dividends ultimately with this business model. Have you gone into that uh, uh, line of study? I'm not fully understanding which type of commissions you are talking about, but uh, so but in any case, so uh, before I give you uh, my answer, uh, are you talking about specific commissions related to dividend distributions or that are that uh, that exist in practice or you're talking about uh, my model because i'm getting confused uh, sorry about that uh, no i'm talking about commission uh, that are uh, based uh, on credit cards on atm services any kind of banking service and that provides the main income of banks. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. But anyway, um, so you're right, the, the, the banking sector is uh, undergoing a huge structural change uh, at the current context. Um, and that's the reason, uh, and let me be careful about uh, a bit about uh, the type of answer I, I give, uh, I provide you with again, and let me highlight that uh, the views that I am expressing here do not necessarily reflect those of, of the ECB, of course. Uh, but let me be clear, very clear about this. Because of all the restrictions the banking sector is currently facing, uh, namely a low interest rate environment, more stringent, more stringent regulation, um, uh, the, the digital, digital structural change, so on and so forth, it is extremely important and it is our responsibility to ensure that rec bank reg banking regulation provides uh, agents with the right incentives and induces the, effect, the intended effects. And that's what I'm trying to attain with the types of, an, uh, of uh, studies that I'm carrying out, even with the last one that I, that I uh, just presented, which is about regulating other parts of the financial sector uh, somehow in a similar way than that in which uh, the banking sector is regulated. Uh, but again, I'm not, I don't want to get into the details, but uh, I, I, I strongly believe that uh, dividend type of regulation uh, that obviously needs to be part of the overall capital regulatory framework that is more aligned with what I am proposing, with what I am proposing um, in principle, should have more benefits. And actually, and actually, you know, the, all measures that have uh, that, that have adopted uh, the the different central banks in this regard, which are again discretionary, should in principle have more uh, negative effects in terms of uh, market volatility because it was 
an unexpected policy shock. It was not incorporated in the information set of, of, of investors. But if we would have an adequate uh, dividend regulation that provides agents with adequate, with adequate incentives and provides banks with the, uh, with the right incentives uh, so that they uh, uh, release their capital buffers in a natural way, we would all be better off. I don't know if this uh, responds okay. Somehow. Yes, yes, thank you. And the, and the last question, uh, again, uh, I don't want to get into the details or make any assessment on what's going on in the U.S. housing market, but uh, but uh, but things are happening. There are economies. There are there are economies in which, like like in the U.K., in which all of a sudden they have to ban they have to temporarily ban redemptions in the in the real estate fund industry because otherwise that uh, was going to uh, to trigger a very severe uh, uh, negative fall in in valuations uh, yes uh, thank okay. you okay that that was a long uh, interaction Maybe yes, uh, we sorry. can move on to our questions. We have uh, a few minutes more. Let, let me clarify that some of us at, uh, at the CAE, so we are in the seminar room, so I'm not a ghost, so even though my micro is closed, I'm using the, um, the room's mic micro, and I'm Luis Put. More questions? Manuel, do you want to add anything? Maybe no, I, that's, maybe I yeah. can ask about. Uh, I wonder whether in your in your last paper is particularly important to think of the sources of situations maybe but, the, the long I, I cannot yeah. hear you properly yeah. last part okay i try again so i wonder whether uh, the loan to value optimal policy uh, should be different uh, depending on the i mean if you are dealing with demand or supply so and then it is worldwide to explore that channel, provided you are able to identify what are. Uh... You mean whether whether policy prescriptions change depending on the nature of the shock? Yeah. Yeah. So what I do, uh, that's a good point. What I do, so according to Jacobello and Neri 2010, which is a very influential paper in in the housing uh, and macroeconomics literature, has over thousands of citations in in in, uh, in Google. Um, um the two types of shocks that mainly drive housing investment and housing prices are technology shocks and uh, housing preference shocks and then there's a third type of shocks of shock which i don't uh, consider but which is the third important source of uh, housing fluctuations which are uh, monetary policy shocks uh, which I didn't include because the, the model is already complex enough and I didn't want to uh, 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 make it even more complicated. Uh, but I have five different types of productivity and housing preference shocks in the model. And regardless of the shock we look at, uh, the, the policy prescription is the same and, uh, and counter-cyclical uh, loan-to-value ratios that affect uh, um, fund managers are more effective in smoothing the credit cycle, property prices, and the business cycle than those that affect uh, uh, households. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll think a little bit more on the implication of this implication of the model. And so, any more questions? Okay, so, so I think we can stop here.
Thank you very much, Manuel, for being with us. And all of you, uh, thanks for being there. Uh, yeah. And stay, stay safe. Yeah, th thanks a lot uh, to all of you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.